Okay. <clears throat> Hans Sharon, 1893-1972. Uh, and indeed, he was one of the most important uh, European architects, not just German, in the 20th century. Someone used these, these words to describe his architecture, the eccentric, democratic architecture of Sharon. Interesting, the, 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 the vicinity of these two words, eccentric and democratic. Usually, we do not associate them because what is democratic doesn't seem to be too eccentric because eccentricity means individualism. Uh, but uh, in, the, in his case, it is, there is some truth. It is uh, eccentric, his architecture, but also democratic. This was the man. Um, when he was younger, uh, and we'll see some pictures where, where, he, where he was older as well. Uh, here he is, uh, smoking a cigar like many important architects. Uh, again, <laughs> a little bit younger and uh, funny, funny looking. Architecture's resistance against Nazism. Nazism. He he did um, he did have conflicts with um, with the Nazi regime regime. And uh, I'm glad that he, I, I'm glad he did. Uh, he, uh, he was in a uh, you know at a more advanced stage, and uh, you know there are all kinds of events. Of course, in Europe there there is great curiosity about Hans Sharun. Not here, no. Here, thousands of people turn their back on a very important architect. Many of them they didn't hear even the name. Anyway, some drawings. Uh, he did, uh, although he had social um, concerns, and indeed his architecture is a democratic architecture, he also had another side. He, he did expressionist drawings, exalted drawings, very much so. And also uh, th there was a part of his activity which leaned towards expressionism. As you can see in these drawings, these, these are uh, indeed uh, expressionistic drawings. They are they are uh, exalted, and look at this. You know, this is a you know what is called a visionary drawing. He did such drawings. Um, well, this actually, sorry, this is by Bruno Taut. This is Hans Sharun. I plan to <laughs> extract this drawing from there, but uh, or maybe I wanted to show. I guess that's what I wanted to do, to show the, the parallelism, because they were contemporaries. Bruno Taut, sorry, uh, Bruno Taut and uh, Hans Sharun. Uh, you see, these are visions of buildings that almost emanate rays of light, just like the sun. Uh, these are some sketches for the Berlin uh, Philharmonia, a very important building by him. And um, in, in the drawings, I actually have a book with uh, drawings of uh, expressionist architecture. He is uh, present there uh, in a significant way. Now, a residential building for Vi from Weissenhof Estate Stuttgart. Weissenhof Estate was a colony and still is. The buildings exist in Stuttgart. Um, you know, so, you know, uh, kind of social housing, but there are also a few private buildings. Buildings built by very important architects in the 1920s, like 1928 or so. This is the building he designed, uh, you know, almost 100 years ago. This is certainly not uh, a building that uh, emanates, uh, uh, you know, uh, being tired or old or uh, something passe. No, quite the opposite. It's, uh, it's, uh, is still fresh, I think, in a you know a certain kind of modernism. And look, it's not just white; there is also some redness, which is good. Anyway, on this on the same campus uh, or you know colony, Le Corbusier built uh, Miss Van der Rohe was well actually the the master of the of the site plan, and uh, other important architects. And here they are, the, the, you know, this, all these buildings belong to the so-called Weissenhof colony. 
and here they are, the, 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 the builders, the, the, the contributors at the bottom, Le Corbusier, then on the right, Walter Gropius, a little bit uh, up on the right, we see Hans Pelzig, Joseph Frank, Hans Sharon, uh, you know, diagonally towards the right corner. There are very important architects, Bruno Taut in the middle, uh, on, the, on the top, uh, Victor Bourgeois, uh, Rudolf, uh, no, this I thought was Schindler, no, uh, Adolf Schneck and uh, Rudolf Schneck, and then Lu Ludwig, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe at the top. Uh, so, indeed, you know, it was a who's who in contemporary architecture one, almost 100 years ago, ago uh, the Dutch uh, JJP owned and so on. Okay, now this is a building that in, in I think, I think it still exists in Wrocław, in, uh, in, uh, in Poland, uh, and it's not bad, uh, you know, uh, and this expresses in a way that duality, democracy and, uh, you know, eccentricity, this, this entrance, you know, part of the building is the eccentric part of it, and then the, the building itself is rather, uh, you know, democratic, so to speak. Okay, um, yes, this is the democratic side. I admire this fact that these architects had a, a built-in duality, so to speak. On one hand, they had exaltation, they had strong emotions, they had idealism, and on the other hand, they had social concerns. Now, of course, there is no contradiction between idealism and social, and social concerns. In fact, it is a form of idealism that generates the social concerns and maybe vice versa as well. Um, well, some of the stars of today do not have social concerns and that is, I think, problematic. So the, that, that building was in, uh, in uh, Poland. Now an apartment building in, uh, in the, Berlin had three colonies of important buildings built during the 20th century. In the 20s, in the 50s, and in the 80s. This is his participation in the 80s, that there are various buildings built in various places and, uh, you know, the Germans do take care of the buildings, as you can see. Now, uh, another building, um, again, Hans Scharun, uh, his democratic social side, uh, so to speak. And, uh, you know, again, I cannot ignore the fact that such an architect had an artistic side that expressed itself through expressionistic gestures, you know, highly personal, uh, almost, uh, yes, eccentric or even idiosyncratic. And on the other hand, eg egalitarian uh, concerns that made him build such, you know, apartment buildings as this one or this one. This is the site plan of that colony. Sorry, you cannot see very well. Where again, very very important architects: Walter Gropius, Hugo Herring, Hans Scharun, uh, built each one of them in various apartment buildings. Uh, you see the Gropius on the left side, and then uh, Hans Scharun at the bottom on the left. Hugo Herring, all those in the center, and again Hugo Herring who is totally unknown in the school here. There is even Otto Barning, another very important architect, and I have a presentation on him too. Uh, and this is, a, this is a very famous house by him from 1930s. I, I mean, it was just five years younger, so to speak, than Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier. But what a difference, you know, I think I'm not sure this building is inferior to Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier. is uh, is very different indeed. You know, it's more modest on the other side, the side, and and uh, on one side or on the other side as well. And on on the other, 
is more uh, exalted and extravagant, that, that part with Esther. Sharon was able to combine, um, you know, um, contradictory uh, elements. Uh, and, and, and from there arose expressionism, from the tension between opposite, uh, you know, forms of, of manifestation. I mean, look at that ceiling. It's, it's, no, it's very, almost pop, very contemporary, and it's one, almost 100 years old. I mean, it, it, you know, it seems almost uh, futuristic, but it's not really. It's, you know, from 1930s, you know, 90 years ago. He's very well known for the Philharmonia uh, or the Philharmonic of Berlin, but he built uh, other buildings, schools included, and we'll, 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 we'll look at them. And you see, he doesn't have a, a, an ideology strongly formulated, like, for example, the Corbusier in Villa Savoie. Here, there is no dogma. It's just you know, an intuitive kind of architecture, which is both rational and irrational, if we can put it in this way. It's a large building. I mean, it's for a family, but, uh, you know, Villa Savoy is not a very small building either. For some reason, I compare them because they are almost contemporaries and Villa Savoy is the paradigmatic modern building uh, uh, you know, in Europe in the 20th century. Some uh, Vasily chairs by um, Marcel Breuer here on the right side. And the interesting, the parapet of the stair, very simple, but also, you know, uh, unique in a way. Another house, 1935, um, with surprising elements, again, because the, the you know, is this uh, rather, um, you know, unexpected meeting between the rectangularity or orthogonality and parts that are not orthogonal. You know, the, the, the collective spaces of the house be, tend to be eccentric, so to speak, here. And then the, you know, rather more modest functions of the house become egalitarian and democratic and uh, more submissive and more subdued. Well, from what I understood, he also used the sloping roof because, you know, around that time, you know, the Nazi regime began to put pressure on architects to, uh, you know, respect the Heimat, to respect the, you know, the, the German soil and the German tradition and so on. But he, while he was a nonconformist, he still had to negotiate between the two. Um, another house, uh, I mean, in the model. So his architecture is visceral, is hybrid, is interesting. I mean, look here, the, yes, with the exception of the, of the sloping roof, it's almost the sloping roof looks like an afterthought. But you look at the plants and you see tension and you see the diagonals that even Rem Kolhas likes. Uh, yeah, there is conflict. Romeo and Juliet, high-rise apartment, Stuttgart from 1954. So he contributed also with housing, but this time of a different sort, this after the war. And, uh, but even these are unique and interesting. Uh, you know, they are blocks of flats, but uh, they have regularity, they have democracy, but they also have here and there surprises and moments of eccentricity, if we are to use uh, that word. A 
look at the plan. You know, uh, it's very interesting. Now, the exaltation of the of the balconies could uh, very well make one think of the balconies in some housing projects by Bjarke Ingels, for example. Another housing, 1955, 1960, I don't know if this was realized, but I like the plan very much. Um, so as opposed to Peter Reisenman, he didn't work with a, with a grid. Where is the grid here? There is no grid. Peter Reisenman said that all architecture has to start with a grid. Well, it seems not all of it. Some of it does, but not all of it. Alvar Alto doesn't start with a grid. Uh, Luis Kahn sometimes does, sometimes he, he doesn't. And there are other architects who don't, uh, don't start with a grid at all. Anyway, uh, but these are large public buildings, you know, uh, large blocks of flats. A girls' school, now a comprehensive school. Uh, look at the school. He advocated the cause of a school that was organic, that that where the public spaces encourage dialogue, uh, conversation, interaction, and uh, I think very valuable, very valid uh, desideratas. Uh, you have multiplicity in unity. You have individual classes, as you can see them, but you also have unity because these individual classes, classes then open towards the public spaces, which are uh, conducive to, to dialogue. And, uh, you know, emergence of a social approach to school design. The social approach to school design is important indeed because a school is not just educating, you know, individuals. It's also ed educating individuals to be capable to interact with each other. In other words, to in other words, to create a social group. And this is what the larger, you know, so-called common spaces do. You know, he includes or, uh, you know, creates, you know, small amphitheaters or spaces for, for some kind of interaction wherever he has a public space, a common space. And it's a good idea. I like to imagine that students who are taught, who learn in such a building, become more open to dialogue and to conversation and to, you know, opening up towards, towards other people. It's important. And as opposed to this, if you study in a school where all the classrooms are rectangular and claustrophobic, provoking claustrophobia inevitably, the result is that you get asocial people, uh, you know, because, you know, where there is an excess in, in a negative way, inevitably, the result is, a, you know, a disturbance in your, uh, you know, in your soul, in your mind, in your psychology. You see here, the students are facing each other at each table. Yes, the tables in this particular room are aligned, but the students, there are rows of chairs that face each other, and it's about dialogue. And it's great that it is about dialogue. And look at the amphitheater, you know, it's, it's, it's democratic in spirit, it's luminous, it's optimistic, it's about openness, being open to dialogue, to not be afraid of so-called making mistakes. It's, it's a relaxed uh, amphitheater and the plan is on the left of this, I mean, this particular room is, as you see very well, is on the left side although there are other smaller amphitheaters, as you can see them.
No, no, uh, Sharon was, was, uh, was, was one actually one of the best European architects in the 20th century. No wonder the students here are so interested in him. Okay, so we go from the schools. Uh, here he is, uh, you know, giving a speech. Of course, architects sometimes like to give speeches to tell the to tell uh, you know the audience what they think, what they feel, what how things should be. You know, especially the architect who has some strong beliefs or so-called visions uh, likes to do this. Now we arrive at this very celebrated building, the Berlin Philharmonic or Philharmonia from 1957 to 1963 and you probably know it it's it's a building uh, to my shame I, although i visited berlin two or three times but I, I i never entered this building and i always wanted uh, it's apparently it's music itself the spaces are musical and very conducive to to listening to music and performing music there and the exterior also is musical, you know, it has exaltation. You see uh, the line of the, of, the, of the roofing of the yellowish uh, part of the building. Um, it's a great building. I have a friend uh, in Austria, an architect, who told me this is, this, is, this is the best modern building in Europe. I don't know if I would go so far, but it, it, it is a good building. And they look at the, the large, uh, you know, concert uh, hall. Uh, it's it's look look how the chairs are are uh, situated. Uh, you know, at that time in the fifties, early sixties, there was no, you know, there were we, they didn't have computers. There was no parametric uh, design. Even about fluidity, who talked at that time about fluidity? But here there is fluidity. The spaces are fluid and very musical because the, the lyricism of his vision uh, inspired him to, to create a building that has movement. It's about movement, yes. It's, it's about not being static. It's about not being, uh, you know, um, uh, stuck, you know, just like I keep coming back. The students here are stuck, they are in inertia. They don't want to move. They don't want to get out of that, that terrible inertia. What can we do? In my opinion, they are not alive. This is my opinion. They only think they are alive. They are not alive. Maybe Heraclitus was right. Heraclitus said that actually what we call life is death and that real life is after death. Uh, I don't know. It sounds strange, no? But who knows? Sometimes I'm tempted to think in this way as well. Is, is this life really life? You know, maybe it's not, maybe it's death. Anyway, let's, let's leave morbidity behind and uh, let's come back to a great building, celebrating music, celebrating architecture, celebrating the earth and the sky, celebrating uh, creativity because this is what it is about. It doesn't matter, 50s, 60s, 90s, uh, you know, it, it's a building that transcends time. It's modern, but it's moderately modern on one hand and uh, hyper -modern, modern on the other. Here on the left, we see a sculpture by uh, Richard Serra, the North American uh, sculptor with rusted uh, iron, um, like uh, rusted steel. Uh, it's easy to recognize because this is what he always uh, does. Uh, look at the plan, you know, it's like he didn't have a T-square and a rectangle. It's, it's born. And you saw an initial sketch for this building at the beginning. Look at the plan, you know, it, it's alive. It's, it has movement. It's, it's, Controversial even to an extent, because life itself is like that, controversial. In other words, it's, it, it, there are hybridities there at play, you know, and tensions and uh, conflict, yeah.
Right? We can see the age of the of the building by contemplating the age of the car. You know, while the building building didn't age, the design of the of the of the car did change. Salute high-rise apartments in Stuttgart. Uh, we saw something similar uh, earlier, but here you see the plan in all its glory, if I can say so. Access to the apartments from a uh, ex exterior external corridor. I always like this kind of uh, uh, designs because they allow you for, uh, you know, for um, uh, cross ventilation and uh, the apartments uh, are, are very easy to, to, to design properly. When you access apartments from an external, external corridor, you have double orientation, meaning cross ventilation, and it's, it's just uh, very easy to do uh, well-functioning apartments. Another school in Marl, 1960s, a little bit different from the previous one. It, the schools have something in, in, in common. Obviously, it's the same creator, the same author, the same architect, but they are also different. So he's not, you know, copying himself really. There are some corridors here and there, but essentially this is a school without corridors, you know, just fragments of corridors and, you know, not straight long corridors, no. And, uh, it's this ambivalence, you know, you have spaces that uh, seem to be defined by a certain function, but actually there is no function. And so there are spaces in between those beloved spaces where anything could happen or unexpected things could happen. I think that, that those spaces, such spaces are very valuable in general, not just for a school. I mean, important architects even today talk about in-betweenness, the spaces in between. And uh, so Fujimoto, for example, he even talks about, you know, spaces without function or between function and no function. Those spaces actually between function and no function are the most interesting and the most potent architecturally. We saw uh, also, I think there are two or three buildings with the same name or part of the same complex, Salute in Stuttgart. Now, this is an embassy building. I don't know, embassies are difficult to do because, you know, there are institutions for the political elite and um, it's hard to be too eccentric or extravagant, but you know he 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 built this uh, you know embassy. It's I don't know if it is more than decent, but I like other buildings by him more than than this particular embassy. The city theater in Wolfsburg, uh, Wolfsburg, uh, 1965-1973. And here we get again, we see Hans Sharun, uh, you know, uh, playing with the two sides, uh, you know, the, the common uh, spaces uh, here, and then, uh, you know, the public spaces that are contorted and uh, more interesting, and more sculptural and more free and, and moving. Uh, yes. We could almost use the words of Louis Kahn when we contemplate this plan, you know, we could say we have the serving spaces and then we have the served spaces. Because Louis Kahn differentiated between the two kinds of spaces, starting with his well-known building, uh, the Richards Laboratories in uh, Philadelphia, where in those uh, tall brick towers, he placed the uh, technical services, the stairs and so on and uh, the other spaces with a lot of glass were destined for research and education and so on. 
uh, German Maritime Museum. I don't know. I mean, here I like the most this uh, wooden artifact, uh, not so much the building, but uh, and of course the, the ship, the beautiful wooden ship, yes. But that was not done by, uh, by Sharun, nor the wooden sculpture. But this aged uh, wood is, um, is, is, uh, is beautiful, I think. Now, this is a big, uh, you know, uh, building, you know, this it's the state library. It's in Berlin, 1964, 1975. Look at it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's almost like a factory, you know, a large factory. It's a library. In a way, it's the factory of, of, of learning. What you see behind this tall building, this is by Renzo Piano. But this one in the front is by Hans Sharun. And yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, a large complex uh, building. A little bit frightening, these uh, large organisms destined to, to culture, I think. But, you know, what can you do? It's a big city, a very big city with a lot of people who study and uh, I guess you, it's needed. Although another approach to, to study would be to create a constellation of small uh, libraries. Maybe they have both. But this one is quite, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> impressive considering its, its, uh, its side, size. Okay, and now we go to the uh, presentation with the other two architects. So Hans Sharun died on the 25th of November, but you see now some works by two architects who were born on the 25th of November. One Italian and the other one American, although understood born in Ukraine and he immigrated uh, to, um, to the States. Stefano Boeri, probably you know his uh, vertical forest, uh, you know, contribution to the Milano skyline he was, um, uh, I have a little text here. So Stefano Boeri, if you are so kind to turn off the microphone, thank you. Is an Italian architect and urban planner born in Milan in 1956, founding partner of Stefano Boeri Architecti. He earned a master's degree in architecture from the Polytechnic University of Milan and a PhD in architecture in 1989 from the University of Venice. From what I understood, the only architectural university in, uh, in, in Italy is in Venice. Among the most known projects are the vertical forest in Milan, the Villa Mediterranea in Marseille, and the House of the Sea of La Maddalena. You'll see all th these three projects by him. I just want to say that since he studied at the University of Venice, where one of the most famous uh, professors was uh, Carlos Scarpa. Uh, of course, uh, they also had uh, Tafuri teaching the Francesco Dalco. They had some great names, but Carlos Scarpa was probably the greatest. But I don't know if you know Carlos Scarpa, who was without doubt, together with Luis Kahn, the most important architects of the second half of the 20th century. Uh, he didn't have an, an, a diploma. He, that's why he couldn't teach architecture at the University of Venice. He was forced to teach interior design or interior architecture. And, uh, you know, again, we are talking about Carlos Scarpa. So you see the, the, the conflict between bureaucracy, bureaucracy and creativity uh, pushes sometimes the limits of endurance very, very far. The vertical forest, Milano. Uh, somehow it sounds better in Italian, but uh, I forgot exactly how it is in Italian. Anyway, it is not too far away. I mean, these two towers are not far away from the railway station in Milan. The, uh, you know, the notoriously large, uh, Im imposant, uh, grandiose uh, railway station in Milan. I myself did once two projects, if I can call them so, for... Uh, signage, uh, light signage in front of the train station in Milan, 
uh, the beginning of the, the year 2000s for the new millennium. I did them, but I didn't send them. I was at that time in New York, but I can tell you what I did. So you realize what, uh, what a strange man I, I, I am if you didn't yet. The first proposal for, uh, you know, the, the project, the, the theme of the project was to create a, a luminous sign in front of the train station, the largest train station in Europe, if not in, in the whole world. So my first reaction was to create a mound, a mound, a little mound, you know, like six meters in diameter and tall about three meters and covered with grass and populated. I, I was obviously dreaming, although I didn't drink anything, but populated with a colony of uh, fireflies. So I thought a monk, specially hired for the occasion, uh, to take care of that colony of, of fireflies, and, and you know, not so they would not leave the, the 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 mound. So I thought in the summer when fireflies emit some light, you know, very light light, very discreet, you know, to 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 just see this mound, which in the winter was white, in the spring was green in the summer was uh, even more green, if I can say so, and in the fall was reddish, but, but populated with these fireflies that sometimes would emit light, probably during the summer, very discreetly. And the second proposal was more difficult to, 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 to describe uh, because I thought a train station is a place of transition, is a threshold between here and there, you take the train to go away, or you wait for someone who comes by the train. It's a very special place, the rail, railway station. So I, I, I did something to, to uh, um, you know, connect and express this theme of, of some kind of a ritualistic, uh, uh, you know, uh, passage, the passage of uh, transition from one state to another through the train station. Maybe one day I'll show you what I did. Okay, so back to the vertical forest, you know, uh, that to me is not really great, great, great architecture. It is a little bit convenient to just make a block of flats and, um, you know, uh, crucify some trees there in the balconies. But maybe the word crucify is not appropriate. Maybe the, maybe the trees are not as unhappy as I might be tempted to think they are. I do remember I once asked a French architect who did something similar. I asked him, did you ask the trees if they would agree to spring from a balcony, from a slab of concrete? Of course, there is some earth there, but it's just a layer of earth. It's not really the earth. But he said that, you know, he consulted himself with, this is an interesting French architect, Tetrarch uh, in, uh, in uh, Le Havre, I think, or Nantes. Anyway, uh, he said, I, we talked with our horti horticulturist, uh, horticulture people, we talked with scientists, and they all agreed that uh, a tree could, could be quite comfortable in this situation on the 10th floor or 15th or the, the 8th floor. I don't know. But Stefano Boeri did something here a little bit better than some other architects who tried the same thing. I don't know, maybe he, because he played with the balconies, they are not aligned. So it's not a, a rationalistic grid. You know, it's, there is some kind of, uh, of movement. So nature is present here, not just because of the green of the, of the trees or the bushes, but also because of the, the, the more natural movement of the, of the balconies. So there is a certain degree of, uh, of freedom, if you want. So I, I, I think he didn't do a good, a, a bad job, actually. Although conceptually speaking, this attempt is not so mysterious or complex. Essentially, he has a block of flats, a, 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 you know, a tower or two, and then he he plays with the balconies, and then he he places on the balconies lots of you know, vegetable material or plants or trees or whatever they are. Here you see in the section, you know. Uh, so the idea is not 
maybe it's not even so original. I know some other people practice something similar, but he realized it uh, in, in acceptable terms. That's why these towers are very celebrated and, and well known. Uh, so it does look we are kind of desperate to bring back nature because yes, you see the building here behind, you know, where is the nature? You know, man, there is some nature at the bottom in this case, but uh, most of the time we banished nature from our, um, you know, uh, cities because, uh, yeah, um, it would have been inconvenient, but it's not inconvenient. So now we have to climb the facades of the buildings with a, with a green. Anyway, if you arrive in Milan, if the pandemic goes, um, these two towers are right near the train station, very close to the train station. So here I have better plans. You know, indeed, the, 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 the green emanates from the building. If you remove the green and you remove the balconies, what do you get? You know, the, you know, the typical, uh, you know, block of flats. But uh, because of this green, um, it, the building opens up. The box is broken. The apartments are not uh, spectacular, are not really very special, I think. But because of, of this uh, you know, second skin or, or this uh, flamboyance, this is the flamboyance of nature you know, uh, hiding away, in a way, the building. And uh, I think it's OK. Why not? Um, so you see on the left, the scheme is very, you know, logical and cerebral and objective, but more and more to, towards the right, the building obtains, achieves, and aspires towards a higher degree of freedom. So it's not just about hanging on the, the elevations of the buildings, some plants. There is more to it, I think. It's the inner freedom of the architect, actually, which accompanied uh, the, the, the freedom of nature. So we have two freedoms in a way, the freedom of nature, of the trees, of the bushes, and the freedom of the architect who was playful with the balconies and, you know, irritated, if I can say so, the, you know, the vertical predictability of the, of the prism. Also look at the structure. The structure is kind of interesting too, because he, he doesn't have structural supports in the corners. There, are, there is no column here. There are two columns like this. And this does have an effect on the design. Also, the fact that he has two types of columns, you know, those oriented parallel with the facade and those perpendicular on the facade. So there is, a, there is some complexity here. And as I said, it has to do with a degree of freedom that the architect himself had within. And he's a sophisticated architect. He was editor in chief of Domus uh, for some years and then editor in chief of, of uh, Abitare, the important architectural and design magazines in, in, in Italy. Now, the, the hanging gardens of Milan, the balconies are quite large. You see, you know, you, you could place even a table for eight chairs there and still have a lot of space around it. So these are not ordinary, uh, you know, uh, little narrow uh, uh, balconies, no. Anyway, it, it, the more I look at it, the more I like it. And it, actually, you know, we do need nature, that's the truth. The more, the better. Otherwise, we'll suffocate the earth beyond repair. It's already suffocated beyond repair. It's known. It is known. The, the icebergs are, are melting down. The levels of the sea seas rises. The pollution is incredible. 
So we have, we have big problems. It's not just the pandemic. The climate change might be even, even more serious than the pandemic because maybe hopefully for the pandemic, the vaccine or the vaccines will take care of, but what do you do with the climate change? You know, how are we going to reverse the change of the climate? What are we going to do if our children will, uh, you know, receive from us the great present, a climate that is with a few degrees uh, hotter? You know, uh, uh, do we think of these matters? N not as much as we should. We have that young girl from Sweden who thinks more about uh, this issue than we do. So gold, grown up, wise people. We are not wise. We will not give up the cars for anything in the world. And it's known the car produces pollution. Are we willing to renounce our cars? No, of course not because we need speed. Well, we need gas, gasoline, we need oil. We are, well, th for that, we start the war in Iraq. We kill one million people, it's okay. It's worth it, it's for the oil. As Ingmar Berman in a beautiful film uh, uh, he, he, he did, uh, just to show the, in an amusing way the importance of oil, of, of gas, a doctor stops at the gas station and uh, the man who was uh, the owner of the gas station refuses to receive money from the doctor because uh, the doctor earlier in time helped his family in some, with some health issue. And, uh, you know, he said, uh, doctor, you know, I cannot receive money because certain things cannot be paid with money, not even with gas. In other words, uh, not even gas, you know, in, in, in other words, gas is, is the, the sumum of, of what is valuable in our world. That's why Mr. Bush and uh, the American uh, political elite started the war in Iraq, right? Who cares uh, between 100,000 people and 1 million Iraqis died and 35 American soldiers uh, died and many, many, many of them crippled you know, who cares? We got gas, cheap gas. That's the goal. Villa Mediterranea in Marseille, <laughs> you know, the French accent is the French accent. Um, I spent myself a night in Marseille uh, sleeping on a bench, a little bit afraid because Marseille is um, not the safest world, uh, city in the world, but I love Marseille. I went to see L'Unité d'Habitation by Le Corbusier, and yes, Marseille is a magnificent city because it is at least bicultural, you know, it's Western, it's French, but also there is a lot of population from Northern Africa, and then there is the Mediterranean Sea, which is magnificent. So it's, it's I don't know, it's, 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 it's beautifully heterogeneous and dual and alive and dangerous. That's why I didn't quite sleep on that bench in, uh, that night in, in a park there. The building, in my opinion, could have been more animated. Uh, it's, it's a cantilevered uh, thing that is very fashionable these days. But where, where, where is the vertical forest? Where is the forest? You know, yes, there is the sea. And that is because, not because of Stefano Boeri, but because of uh, God who made the uh, you know, the Mediterranean Sea. Anyway, La Villa Mediterranea is a large public building which houses research, documentation, and projects that concern the contemporary condition of, Mediterranean, of the Mediterranean Sea. The building is located on the docks of the port of Marseille, next to the Museum of Mediterranean History, promoted by the French state in collaboration with the city. Okay, and here it is. Uh, we have seen many buildings like this, it's, you know, but it's okay, it's a decent building, but I wouldn't say it's more than that. Uh, and uh, what can we say, the interior is vast, but uh, rather cold, in my opinion. Anyway, we do have some stones that are very alive in the foreground and an old church on the right. And um, we see nobody here, which, you know, some people think uh, that architecture looks best, best without people. 
with the exception of Toyo Ito, who said, uh, I always wanted to do an architecture that looks better with people. And, uh, but it's true, I myself, when I like to take photographs of buildings, I would have liked to see no people at all, <laughs> just the buildings. Anyway, um, so this is also Stefan uh, uh, Boeri, uh, you know, besides the, the, the you know, uh, audacious, to an extent, the moderate the moderately audacious, to use an oxymoron, uh, structure is, uh, I would say, a rather banal building. But the water uh, always uh, is, uh, is a plus. And the windows could be small or could be a little bit wider, uh, larger, I don't know. It, it, to me, it's still a cold building. But, but water is not cold, even when it's cold. Anyway, the house of the sea. He was lucky, you know, to do two large buildings in the proximity of the sea. So the text de description provided by the architects, part of, uh, you know, a lot of numbers there, recovery and restructuring project aimed at creating a public and mixed use complex surrounding the harbor of the ex-military arsenal at the La Madalena. House of the Sea is a glass, Danube, but I don't know where it is. I mean, there is an arsenal in, uh, in, in Venice, but I don't think this is in Venice. House of the Sea is a glass and basalt prism that cantilevers over the water. Almost 2,000 square meters, the new construction hosts a large event and conference hall suspended six meters above water that looks out towards the extraordinary panorama of the Galura. Okay, and here it is. Uh, yeah, why not? But then, why yes? It's fine. I, I like rather that map there of the world. Uh, and the stair is also, um, you know, a, a rather elegant. And the tension with, uh, with the reflections in that mirror, uh, that wall. Anyway, but then he has this, um, you know, this grid, this ornamental grid, which is a good intention, like a curtain a curtain for the outside of the building, but the curtain is rather timid and, 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 and reticent. Well, and he uses, you know, uh, the same decorative uh, uh, pattern also on the ceiling, as you can see, and you'll see also the drawings. But the idea to, to, to have a double skin and to, to have a, some kind of a veil, it's a veil building. Why is it veiled? Because if it was not veiled, it would have been really just a, a banal prism, despite the cantilever part. But the veil brings to it some a little bit of sensitivity. In a way, even the vertical forest buildings are veiled as well, veiled by the green of the trees and the bushes. In this case, there is there are there is, there, is no, there are no plants, but is this curtain architectural curtain that veils the building in a way? I mean, partially it hides it away, and uh, I think hiding has uh, um, uh, potential in architecture. You know, to to hide a little bit certain things, you know, not to show everything. Uh, you know. Uh, brutally uh, to, to, yeah, to hide certain things. I think that the theme of the veil in architecture is interesting and I, I am going to prepare a presentation called just like that, the veil in architecture. And this is the, the ceiling plan and then uh, the plan. It's clean, it's nice, it's, it's okay, it's rational, but it's rationalistic, but it's, it's okay. And, uh, you know, uh, there are, you know, deviations through diagonals, but in essence, it's still rather a rationalistic building. And the sections, unfortunately, there are no diagonals in the section, and I think this is, uh, when you use diagonals in the plan and you don't use them in the sections, there is a chance that you arrive at, cert at a certain level of sterility. 
the sections do not have diagonals. And it shows, yes, you have the so-called dia metaphorical diagonal of the cantilever part, but is this architect telling us that the only, to use the word uh, associated with Hans Sharon, eccentricity is uh, in architecture is the, the cantilever part, that's all there is. That's the only adventure we can uh, envision or and afford in architecture, I think is too little. And uh, we see the veil, the, the ornamental uh, veil. And we see parts of it here. And now we arrive at the last uh, presentation today. Uh, this uh, architect uh, who turned me off initially and I almost dropped him. But because he was talked highly about at Columbia University, I thought, let me, let me look a, into, a little bit into his work. I still find his work uh, too commercial for my taste. Um, and uh, so was an architect primarily known for his neo-baroque Miami modern hotels constructed in the 50s and 60s, which have since come to define that era's resort hotel style synonymous with Miami and Miami Beach. So he was born in 1902, you see in Nove on November 25th and uh, lived a long life, 99 years. Good for him, but he doesn't look too happy here and I wouldn't be too happy in his place either, even at 90 or 95 after a life spent for, you know, building uh, hotels, you know, in Miami. And uh, this, uh, this picture of him disturbs me even more, saddens me even more than the previous one. At least here he is honestly sad. Here he is hiding his sadness be behind those exotic uh, uh, eyeglasses or eye frames or sunglasses. And uh, <laughs> what can you say? Anyway, it's just another man that made the uh, um, Frank Lloyd Wright say nothing wrong with architecture except the architects. And, uh, you know, these are two pages from a book with his works, the neo-baroque Miami or Miami Beach uh, architecture. And it's just uh, towards the end of this presentation, you'll see uh, the comments of uh, actually a Romanian. I don't know what she was. She has a blog on, on this gentleman. Maurice Lapidus, and, and she, she saw that he created for joy, to give joy people, to give people joy. But uh, I don't know, it's something about his joy that turns me off. And he didn't look so joyous either. Anyway, it's, a, it's an architecture that, um, yeah, is maybe not the worst, but it's not the best either. And uh, it's some kind of a combination between, um, you know, uh, something almost academically classical or classicist with small, small betrayals. In essence, it's an architecture destined for, you know, provoking delusions and the, or illusions uh, or delusions in people, you know, hotels, you know, uh, temporary escape from the banality of life. That's what he creates here. If he calls this joy, I, I would call this de deceiving, um, you know, because it's not a real idealism. It's just mimicking, uh, in my opinion, idealism. In fact, it saddens me very much some of this architecture, maybe not all of it. This one, for example, seems to be a little bit more democratically joyous, maybe a little bit just, but but mainly because of the artwork in colors, which he didn't do, was done by an artist. Now we see a living room, you know, that is uh, one of his villas, you know, Florida, what can we say? It's Florida, you know, uh, try to remove the carpet, try to remove the, the, that kind of artwork or art shelving on the wall and try to remove also the seating area, which is, you know, a little burlesque and Baroque and what do, we do, what do we get? Not much really. Maurice Lapidus, The Architecture of Joy by Irina Marinescu. I don't know who Irina Marinescu is, but, uh, or was, but uh, she was or is obviously a Romanian. 
Sau nu știu pentru care motiv, azi mi-a venit în minte, obsesiv, numele arhitectului Morris Lapidus, cel mai probabil printr-o asociere de imagini, pentru că arhitectura lui mă duce cu gândul la fata Morgana și la reveriile filmice pe care le am în fiecare vară. I don't know for what reason, but the name of Morris Lapidus is probably uh, the most probable came to me uh, through an association of images because his architecture makes me go, uh, makes me think of Fata Morgana and the filmic uh, reveries or the cinematographic reveries that I don't know what she means by Leam in Fiecare Vara. Ah, that she dreams of uh, or has every summer. I don't know if that's her with him. I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe not. He's washing dishes because in the United States it is uh, said, it's not always true, but it is said that men wash the dishes in the United States, which is a little bit unusual. In most countries, unfortunately, it is still the woman. The woman who does everything, she gives birth, she takes care of the children, she goes to the architecture offices, she washes the dishes, she washes the clothes, she cooks, she does everything. And the man, you know, is reading the newspaper and watching a soccer game. But in this case, you see the happy architect with a bow tie, he's uh, cleaning up the plates, maybe just for the camera or maybe not. My whole success is I've always been designing for people. First, because I wanted to sell them merchandise. Great. Then when I got into hotels, I had to rethink, not TI, what am I selling now? You are selling a good time. So he was selling a good time. Uh, or so he thought. I would have been depressed. But other people probably enjoy the reveries that he provoked. I don't know. This image, though, is kind of interesting. The, you know, the stair with a, you know, glassed uh, part of the roofing. Uh, this I kind of like. Uh, and even this one, I think the photographer did a good job. You know, these are some fragments of his architecture. My presentation will end very soon. It's short. Maybe he deserves a little more, but I did it on the occasion of his birthday, and we wish him happy birthday. And around 1960, Miami Beach architect Maurice Lapidus, whose credits include Miami Beach Fontainebleau, uh, it's probably Fontainebleau, not Fontainebleau, but who cares? And Eden Rock Hotels was commissioned to redesign Lincoln Road. Laps, Lapidus design for Lincoln Road, uh, you know, by the way, this is a mistake in English. When your name, when, when a name ends with an S, you don't place another S here in, in, such, a, in such a case. But uh, who wrote this text? Maybe it was an immigrant just like uh, Mr. Lapidus. Or maybe not. Actually, North Americans are terrible at, 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 at grammar in general. So complete with gardens, fountains, shelters, architectural folies, shade structures, each shade structures Each, each shade structure, without the plural, exploits one 20th century technology in concrete construction, folded plates, cantilevers, floating slabs, etc. And an amphitheater reflected the Miami modern architecture. Now, this is probably translating into English, maybe from, from, from uh, Spanish or something or MIMO style that Lapidus pioneered in the 50s. The road was close to traffic and became one of the nation's first pedestrian malls. Of course, someone who designs a lot of commercial ho hotels has to design uh, a few malls as well. And this is the last image of the picture, uh, of, of, of the presentation today. What do we see? Well, we see luxe, calm et volupté. We see people enjoying themselves, losing their lives, Uh, laying on the on the on, the, on those uh, beds, and by the way of this, I think Philip Johnson was right when he said, "When I can build another skyscraper, why should I lay on the beach on a on an armchair or on a on a bed like these people?" You know, but uh, not everybody thought or thinks like Philip Johnson, and Philip Johnson perhaps himself is not such a great name to quote from. 
but it just uh, um, came to my mind uh, what he said about uh, vacations. I'm actually very depressed during vacations because I, I have a feeling it's really losing one's time, you know, when, when you can do something better. For example, um, you know, give, uh, give some talks or uh, make some presentations on Zoom. Thank you very much.